Good morning. Well, as PT said, welcome. Welcome to Bayside. We're glad you are uh, with us. Glad you're with us this morning. It's great to have you all here. Um, we have something, and, and just before we get started officially this morning, um, we have something right after the service uh, called Bayside 101. And so if you are new or newer at all to Bayside, um, and you'd like to just get a little tour around the building and ask a couple questions. I guess no matter how long you've been here, if that sounds good to you, um, just right after the service, um, head straight out and uh, there'll be a sign there, Bayside 101, and just somebody waiting there for you to kind of just walk you around. And so we'd encourage you to do that this morning. Um, if you'd like to just know a little bit more, ask some questions. Um, I will try to remind you of that at the end of the service as well. So, um, But anyway, we are, we are thankful that you're here. Um, we're going to be looking this morning um, actually at four words, uh, just four pretty simple words, words you've heard before certainly, um, and we're going to be looking at them through the life of a guy named Philip, and, and these, are, these are the four words. First one is the word find, then follow, then faith, and I can't tell you the fourth word yet, okay? Find, follow, faith, and, and a mystery word. We're going to start actually this morning by talking about a story of when Jesus was going out and he was recruiting some followers, recruiting some disciples. Um, in the Greek, that's the word Talmudin. That's just a cool word. And so he's going out and he's kind of finding all of these people. And we see this, to me, it's a really interesting dynamic, kind of a picture of, of, of God and a picture of us at the same time in this story. And so if you have Bibles, you can turn to John 1. We're going to be in these three verses almost the entire morning. Um, if you don't have a Bible, it will be up on the screen. Uh, if you don't own a Bible, uh, there's one in front of you. Um, or if you'd like a new one, <laughs> There's one in front of you. Take that one home. That's our gift to you, okay? But let's read these three verses as we get started, and we're going to look at this dynamic. Again, find, follow, faith, and, and maybe a fourth word. John 1.43 says, The next day Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, son of Joseph. Find, follow, faith. Uh, let's open in prayer. Father, um, first of all, we do thank you, God, that you are so worthy. You are so worthy of our worship. And, and Lord, worship involves so much more than just singing, although you're worthy of our praise as well, God. And and, and Father, I pray that now our hearts would be tuned into you. God, that we would sort of slow down and, and just think on, on what you may have for us today. Think on your word. Think on your story. God, that, that we could hear clearly from you. Um, so Father, we're going to need your Holy Spirit to do that. And so we're asking that you'd be with us through your spirit, speaking directly, clearly. Um, open our eyes, open our ears from a spiritual standpoint. Lord, to hear this morning. May we be humbly ready, God, to, uh, to hear from you. So, so we thank you. We pray to that end. Um, and we just pray all of this now in the name of your son, Jesus. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. So let's look at this account kind of closely here. It says pretty clearly in verse 43, he found Philip. So, so Jesus went and, and found Philip. But then if you look at verse 45, um, Philip found Nathanael. But then Philip said, we found him. <laughs> so, so, so Jesus clearly found Philip, but then Philip's testimony was, we found him. So who found who? <laughs> That's the first question we're going to explore this morning, and this is the first thing I want us to think about. Do I have to find God, or does God find me? Do I have to, if I want a connected relationship with the God of the universe, do I have to go out and find him or does, does he find me? Now maybe you've heard people say, oh, I know that guy. That guy went out, he found religion. He found it. He found something religious. Or, or maybe you've heard even a personal testimony, I found Jesus. Or, or maybe sort of a spiritual testimony, I found inner peace. Or kind of a generic thing, I found the answer. Have you heard any of those Things, Yeah, you know, so the question is, did those people find God or did they find something else or, or did God find them? 
Not sure if you heard this story of a family. Um, they had an eight-year-old boy. They were, they were camping in the boundary waters. And the eight-year-old boy went off on an, on an exploration into the woods and actually got lost. And he was lost by himself in the woods for three days. And finally, they had to send a search party. And, and they combed the area. And after three days, they found, they found this boy. And he was heading in the exact opposite direction probably would have gotten lost and probably would not have survived, heading in the wrong direction. And, and they, they find this boy and there's hugs and reunion and it's wonderful. And, and the first thing that he said is, I'm so happy, little eight-year-old boy, I found you. <laughs> well, did he? You know, may, maybe in one sense he did. You know, I guess personally, I'm getting more and more comfortable with and certainly more appreciative of the fact that God found me. I'm getting really comfortable with the fact that God went on a search and found me. So you may ask, okay, Mark, does that mean you're a Calvinist? If you know what that title means, does that mean you're sort of talking about this predestination, you're predestined for salvation and some are and some are not? Well, I'm not gonna tell you the answer to that question this morning. But join us on Wednesday nights, because on Wednesday nights, we're going to explore that through the life of his disciples. You know, because the disciples bring that up. Did they choose Jesus, or did Jesus choose them? We're going to look at that and other issues as we walk through the life of the disciples, and as we look at that. But you know what? I think like Philip, from one perspective, I can say, I did find Jesus. I think I can honestly say I found him. And yet I think when I step back and look at it from a broader perspective, when I get sort of the 10,000 foot view, I think he found me. So let's answer the question. Did we find God or did he find us? I think the answer is yes. <laughs> yes. Both. He finds us and from, we find him from a different perspective. The answer is yes. Okay, so how then does God show up in our life? How do we find him and he find us? How, how does this connection happen? Well, let's go back to the story. Let's read verse 45 again. And I think this is a neat example of how many times God will find us. Verse 45 says, Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, son of Joseph. So do you see what's happening here? Philip went out and found Nathanael. He went out and found him and said, we found him. Many times, God will find you through helping you to find one of his followers. Many times, God will find you, interact with you in your life by someone else coming into your life and telling you about him. You know, maybe somebody will tell you their story of how they found Jesus well, what's happening? God is finding you through that relationship with a friend. That was certainly the case for Nathaniel. Nathaniel found Jesus because Philip had, and he was willing to, to share that. Maybe, maybe I can be Philip for you this morning. Maybe my testimony of how I found Jesus and how he found me can help God find you. You know, sometimes the testimony of a friend is what, is what brings that up. I think the most clear and reliable path to finding God is right here. It's his word. The most reliable place that you can be guaranteed to find God if you are really on a search for him and if you want him to find you and interact in your life, you find him through the word. It's the most reliable, clear, best choice that you have to find the Lord. Hebrews 4.12 says that the word of God is literally living and active. Living and active. That means that there is life in this book. So, so then the question is, if I'm seeking God and I want to have a connection with him, am I here? Am, am I going to the main source to find him? And, and if, if you want to find God and you've never even known where to search, well, start with the gospel that we're reading this morning, the gospel of John. It's a beautiful book to start finding God and having him find you. You know, God can also find us and some unexpected times and some very curious places. Has God ever met you in a, in a curious place? Well, I was a freshman at UMD, Minnesota Duluth over there, and I took a class called the Philosophy of Religion. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> I can just be honest with you, I was not prepared for this class. 
I was born and raised, wonderful Christian home. Wonderful place, and I was raised with a Christian perspective and upbringing and worldview, and yet I was not prepared for what these professors, there were multiple, were going to share with me. I'm going to be honest with you, it rocked the foundation of my spiritual life. It rocked it. It made me question everything that I had ever believed. I don't know if that was their agenda. I can't tell you what their heart was, but I know for me, it rocked me. And it sent me down on a downward spiral of whether I believed anything that I had thought I believed for the first 19 years of my life. It made me question that. Now you could, you could sit and think, well, what a terrible experience. And we have to, we have to guard our children from, from anything that could have that happen. But I will tell you this, and I do believe we need to guard our children. But I will tell you this, that God found me in that class. The thing that rocked my world, maybe more than anything had up until that point from a spiritual perspective, God found me there. And I found him there. And it's an unlikely way that he found me in that class, but he did. He saw a sincere heart that was seeking to know, and he found me. I want to read you two verses that helped in that, and then I'll tell you how that helped. Romans 1, verses 19 and 20. For what can be known about God is plain to them or plain to us because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived. That means that we can know about God and he's going to tell us how. Ever since the creation, that's a key word, of the world in the things that have been made. What is this verse saying? We can go out and look at creation and what an amazing time of year to go look at creation. Leaves are changing, a little, little crispness in the air. It's a beautiful, it's my favorite season. I love the fall. My wife loves the summer. It's okay, we're different. But what an amazing time, and what this verse is saying is we can go out in creation and know that God is divine, know that he is all-powerful, know that because there is a creation that is so unique, we can know that there is a creator. And that is the message that kept coming back to me as people were pouring this, these ideas into my head. No, if there is a creation, then there is a creator. And the thing that best explained the creator and the creation was God's word. There was nothing that compared to the truth of, of, of what I saw experienced in nature like Christianity. And so God met me on this downward spiral on this rocking of my world and everything that I believed, he met me there. So God can find us in some very unlikely places. If we are searching and we want to know him and we want to experience him, he can find us in a lot of different places. I was in a crisis of belief, literally a crisis of, have you ever been in a crisis of belief where you question everything you ever thought to be true? It doesn't make you bad, it makes you human. And when we are in that place, if we are truly seeking him, he will find us there because his heart is to show us and interact with us himself. All right, second question is this. If he finds me and I find him, how do I follow? If he finds me, how do I follow? I want to read verse 43 again from our text. It says, the next day Jesus went to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now, we talked about this on our Wednesday nights. Have, have any of you ever thought that it's crazy that, that a guy named Jesus would walk up to some people that supposedly he didn't know, say, follow me, and they just leave everything and follow him? Have you ever thought that was kind of crazy? Well, you're either lying or you don't want to put your hands up. <laughs> That's a crazy thought. But we looked at what, why that wasn't so, so crazy over the top is we looked at what it really took to become a rabbi or even to become a disciple of a rabbi. You know, it, to become a rabbi in that culture was, was probably the highest attaining office that one could get to. So we have to realize that, first of all, that to be a rabbi was, was the highest, looked up to maybe more than, than anything else. And, and you'd have to go through three levels of schooling. And you'd have to, as you went through the first level that started at age six and ended at about age 10, if you were the best of the best, then you could go to sort of your secondary education. If you weren't, you were sent home to go do the family business, which was fishing or carpentry or something like that. And then if you went to the second level of education and you were the best of the best of the best, then, then you'd make it to the third level. 
And what you would do at the third level, and by now you've already memorized the entire first five books of the Old Testament, the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And then if you were the best of the best, you'd begin to memorize the entire Old Testament. And then when you got to that point, you would go to a rabbi that you respected, and you would say to him, Rabbi, I want to be your Talmudin. I want to be your disciple. And then the rabbi would begin to question you. Just crazy questions. Like how many times does the word well appear in the book of Genesis? And you'd have to answer that question. Does anybody know that this morning? <laughs> yeah, I don't. How, and what do you do is you just do this intense questioning. And then, if, if, and then after that time of questioning, he would say one of two things to you. If he thought you were good, because you were already the best of the best, but if he thought you were good but you couldn't quite make it, he'd say, yes, you know the Torah. You are very good, but you will not be my Talmudin. And then he'd say, and I thought this was harsh, he'd say, you need to go home and make babies. And you need to pray that those babies will be worthy to be rabbi. And he'd send them home. But if he thought you had that upper echelon, everything that it took, proved because of all those years, he'd say, yes, you can follow me. And that is the way that they were chosen. And then they would follow this rabbi for up to 15 years until at the age of 30, they would become a rabbi themselves. And so when Jesus went to these people, these people who had already somewhere along the line been kicked down the road and say, you know what, you don't quite make it. And they were just doing their family business. When Jesus went to them without asking them any questions or without any knowledge, well, Jesus had knowledge, but with, apparently without any knowledge, and he said, follow me, it was probably the greatest um, source of encouragement that these people could ever have received. And if Jesus was a true rabbi and he was the best of the best of the best of the best, they were getting asked to, be, to follow the greatest of all rabbis. And so it wasn't that it was crazy. It was an amazing honor because Jesus was asking people to follow him who didn't apparently have what it takes. Now, isn't that a beautiful picture of the gospel? Aren't you glad that our salvation is not about what we know or about what we can do or about how educated we may or may not be, about how intelligent and we can answer crazy questions? Aren't you glad your salvation is about grace? Amen? It's a beautiful picture of the gospel. Let's talk about what that word follow means. When Jesus said follow me, let's define that word. To follow means to move behind in the same path, calling, or direction. So we have to ask the obvious question, who is the leader of my life? Who's leading my life? Am I my own leader? Am I the king of my own kingdom? And only you and I know that. Am I making the decisions that I want to make no matter what, bulling my way through? Or am I truly, we sang it this morning, surrendered to Jesus? Have I given up control? Have I said, Jesus, I will follow you no matter where you may lead me? Am I truly following him? And I know that this is a scary proposition because we like being in control. We like being the kings of our own kingdom, don't we? I remember when this came to be very clear to me, I was working at the golf store it was a wonderful season um, and, and making very good, very good money and it was part of what I was thinking I was going to do for the rest of my life. And God, over about a two-year period of time, began to stir up in me, Mark, you're going to do something else. Now, it's easy to leave your job when things are going poorly. Men, you understand what I'm saying? It'd be real easy to walk away when life stinks at work. But life didn't stink at work. In fact, it was probably the height of all things good at work. It was the Tiger Woods era in the golf business. Everybody was buying everything. It was, very, it was a wonderful place. I loved it, and it was going extremely well. And that was the time when God was saying, I think you're going to move on. And he started stirring up my heart towards kids and working with kids. Well, we used to sell these motivational prints, and, and you've probably, maybe you've seen them that has like a golf scene on it, and then it would say like determination, you know, on the bottom, and then it'd have this little catchy thing, and CEOs and salesmen put them up in their office. <laughs> and, and we used to sell these, but they'd always come in a tube like this, because they were always rolled up. And we got a box from this company, and it was a big box, and it was heavy. And I, and I knew I hadn't ordered anything out of the ordinary. And, and I thought, oh, man, they sent us something we didn't need. And, and 
understand the season that I'm in. The Lord is beginning to work in me, Mark. I think I have a different path for you. You know, we ask the question, how do I know when I'm following? I, I don't know how that's going to look for you. But for me, when I, when I took that box and I ripped it open, and I was a little angry, I pulled out, I pulled out this. And, and I read it. It said priorities on it. And it says, 100 years from now, it will not matter what my bank account was, the sort of house I lived in, or the kind of car I drove. But the world may be different because I was important in the life of a child. I don't know how the Lord is going to speak to you to follow him. I called the company and, and I said, you know, you made a mistake. Um, I didn't order this. I said, but can I tell you, can I tell you my story? Can I tell you a little bit about what's been going on? And I told her everything that I just kind of told you. And she said, Mark, um, will you please keep that? Um, but will you take that? Will you, will you literally take that wherever you go? And will you not forget? Will you not forget what you're doing right now? And so I took it, and, and it has followed me. At Youth for Christ, during those 10 years at YFC, it sat right, by, right above my desk. And I looked at it all the time, and when it's getting hard, and I don't know, God, am I doing the right thing? I go back to that. And now it's followed me here, and if you come into my office, you'll see it right above my desk. And it's going to continue to follow me. That wasn't an easy decision to make. I understand there's fear in following. I felt that fear. I've experienced that fear. But at the same time, if we want to follow, he will lead us. If our heart is to follow him as his Talmudin, as his disciple, if that is our heart, he'll lead us. I don't know how he's going to do it for you, but I know what he did for me. Found, follow. So if he finds me and I'm following, third word is this. What is a life of true faith? What is a life of true faith? Let's go back to verse 45. Apologize, I don't like to do that at all. Especially, yeah. Verse 45. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of David. You know, when Philip said we found him, he was saying more than just we found a rabbi to follow. I think some of the disciples just saw Jesus as the best of the best rabbi and followed him, but Philip saw something more. And we know that because he brought it back to Moses and the, and the law and the prophets. What was he saying? We found the spoken of, the prophesied Messiah. We found the Savior of Israel that's been talked about for thousands of years. We found him. We found him. Now, did, did Philip understand probably all the ramifications of Jesus? No. Probably like most of the disciples, he thought Jesus was going to institute an earthly kingdom. And that would be expected. He probably didn't get still that he was going to establish a spiritual kingdom. And he was going to have to die to do it. And yet, Philip saw through the eyes of faith, he said, this is my Messiah. We found our Savior. We found him. We've been hearing about him, thinking about him, talking about him, waiting for him. Well, he's here. And his name is Jesus. You know, many of us in this room, and I would be one, would say this morning, I found my Savior. I found my Jesus. I found the Messiah, the Savior of my soul. Anyone else in this room can say that. You found your Savior. You found your Jesus. And we would say that. If you're here this morning and, and you can't say that, that's okay. Keep joining us as we journey towards him. You know, sometimes we, we, we work out faith in process. Sometimes it's not a want instantaneous, oh man, everything in my world is now different. Sometimes it happens in process. And so keep journeying with us. Follow us as we follow him. As we follow the one that we say we found him, 
Follow us as we do it. You know, do you remember, though, do you remember the season or the day when the gospel, the good news, became clear for you? Can you go back in your mind to that time when, when joy filled your heart initially? I know I can. I remember a season. I don't remember the moment, but I remember a season when joy filled my heart. I want to read a couple of verses from Romans 5. It talks about this. Romans 5, 1 and 2. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. What an amazing verse. You want to memorize a great verse? Memorize that one. Because we have been made right with God because of Jesus, we now have peace. Is your heart and your soul in a place of peace with your creator because of what Jesus did? You know, that's available. It's an amazing place that we can, we can get to simply by accepting and believing and receiving that gift of Jesus and his death on the cross for us. Then it says, through him we also have obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope in the glory of God. We rejoice in hope. I remember not long after, I don't know where I was at exactly in this process, but I was driving down I-35, leaving downtown Duluth and driving down. And I remember driving and, and I'm looking around at things and I'm thinking, man, that sky has never been bluer. I have never had inside, and I couldn't get the smile off my face. What was going on? I was rejoicing in the hope of the glory of God. My soul had been transformed. It had been reborn. And everything, even though it was the same, was kind of different. I was starting my journey with Jesus. And again, if you don't buy this whole package yet, it's okay Join us as we walk this journey together. But there is a hope and a joy and a rejoicing in believing. I want to close this morning by talking about our fourth word. We've talked about find. We've talked about follow. We've talked about faith. And our fourth word this morning is a natural one on this journey. The fourth word is fear. Fear. You know, I think we all struggle with fear of one type or another. I think human nature is to be afraid. We don't always think of that what we're going through is fear. Remember, anxiety, the definition of anxiety is fear that's running rampant in my head or my heart. So I think we all have fear in one way or the other. I think this journey, this journey of faith that we're on can be scary at times. Can it be scary to surrender? I think if it's not, maybe we haven't ever really surrendered. <laughs> I think it's scary to do that, to put your life into the hands of another that you can't see, but that you know is there. I think that's scary. Sometimes we're afraid of the unknown. We fear change. We fear giving up control. We fear the future. We fear that something may happen to a loved one of ours. We fear snakes or heights right? Fear is normal. Four days ago was the anniversary of a very significant event in our country. Wednesday of this week, it had been 12 years since the 9-11 attack, the terroristic attack on America. You know, that was a very fearful time in our country. I don't know if you're like me, but I can remember where I was when I heard the news. I remember where I was sitting. I remember what I had just done. I remember that is burned into me when I heard about the terrorist attacks. It was a fearful time. It was an insecure time. It was an anxious time for many. And I think it ushered in a season of anxiety and fear into our country that in many ways, I don't think it's left. I think, you know, in the moments after 9-11, we turned back to God as a country. Very temporarily, but we turned back to him. Now, we turned away from him once everything kind of settled down, generally speaking, but I don't think the fear and anxiety has left. I think fear and anxiety is epidemic more than it's ever been before in our country. And I think it began 12 years ago. Well, I just finished reading a book, and I'd had this book recommended to me a dozen or more times, 
And finally, I read it, and I read it partially because of the season that we're in, and it's a book about 9-11 and the terroristic attacks, and it's called The Harbinger, and it's become sort of a popular book and a famous book, um, and, and I don't want to get into that book. This is not a book review time. I, I have some foundational issues with the book. There's some key problems with The Harbinger, yet saying that, it's a very intriguing book, and I think one of the main messages, which is an important one, and he uses this phrase over and over and over and over again, is as a country, we need to stay awake. In fact, he uses that phrase consistently, stay awake. Encouraging us to repent, turn back to the Lord, both as a country and individually. Well, on yesterday morning, I couldn't sleep, and I'm not sure why, I won't go into all of that. I think the Lord woke me up again. So at 1.30 in the morning, I finished reading that book yesterday morning. And every time I'd hear stay awake, my mind went back to a little over a year ago when the Lord spoke that message to us. As a congregation, and, and if you weren't here, um, well, I'm gonna encourage you to do something in a minute, whether you were or weren't here. But if you weren't here, the Lord had a pretty clear message for us, I believe, and many have confirmed that as a congregation, we need to stay awake spiritually. And no matter what is going on around us, if our culture is getting spiritually drowsy, we need to wake up. We need to stay awake. We need to be very active and alert and engaged in what the Lord is doing. And he gave us that message. And so yesterday morning, very early, I re-listened to that. And, and through that and through the whole 9-11 and through everything that was kind of going on and is currently going on, the Lord took me to a place where he said, Mark, this is the direction that I want you to go. And this is the direction as a congregation. And over the next couple of months, so our new series is going to be based on a lot of these things that the Lord was kind of doing in my life in the last I don't know, 24 or so hours. And I'm very encouraged about it and I'm very excited about it. I want you to do something this morning. I want to encourage you to do something. Um, yesterday I called Shane, our IT professional. I said, can we get that message on the front page of our website so that everybody can just go on the website and listen? And, and so he did. I think this morning, um, if you go onto our website, this is the front page, and, and there's the message, August 12th of 2012. That was last year, a little over a year ago. You just go on, you push play. Let's see, let's see I don't know if this will play over here, but push play and see this what happens. This week, coming back from vacation. That's it. it it's always kind of an odd thing. Um, it, there's a mix of emotions going on because I, all right, I all right, that's just... Good. I want to encourage everyone, if you were here for that and you know what happened and, and sort of there was even some dramatic things in there, I want you to listen to it again. If you have never listened or this is the first time you ever knew anything about this, I want to encourage you to listen for the first time. I really would like to ask everyone because I think this message is where the Lord is going to be taking us in this next short season of ministry here at Bayside. So I want to ask you to get online. It, it's 30-some minutes long. It, it, it's not that long. It, just listen to that. If you don't have the internet and you want, um, if there's even folks who don't have the internet, and I've heard there are, <laughs> if you don't and you want a CD, okay, just go in the back at the Welcome Center and you can sign up to get a CD of it. Or if you want to, you know, listen to it in your car or something, just, just say, I want the Stay Awake CD. There's a little sign up right back at the Welcome Center. And we'll get that for you by Wednesday. Okay, so sign up today and we'll, we'll get you one made. If you don't have a CD player, <laughs> I don't know, get with the times, I guess. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you more than that. Um, come into my office and I'll speak it to you. <laughs> I'll pull up the notes and I'll give you the message or something. No, I really want to ask you to, to please listen to this. Okay, I don't ask you to do a ton of things around here, but, but it really, this, this is part of that shepherding thing where I really think this is where we're going, so, so will you please just do this? Please get online, make the effort, make the time, listen to this because you will be more prepared for next Sunday morning and when we're going to go and where we're going to go um, if you do. Okay, I can't tell you the name of the series or I can't tell you exactly all of the details, but 
It was one hot summer, right? It might be one chilly fall. <laughs> I want us to close with some beautiful words from Jesus, and I want these words to, 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 to keep us as we go. John 14, verse 27. Jesus speaking, peace. You know, you think about fear and anxiety and uneasiness and being unsettled. And look at what Jesus says. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. You see, Jesus is looking to give us something that the world can't offer. It's explained other places in scripture as a peace that passes all, what? Understanding. That means that it's a peace that makes no sense. That if understanding dwells here, this peace passes it up and goes beyond it. He wants to give us a peace that resides and dwells and that never goes away. He wants to give us that. He offers that. Then look what it says. Let not your hearts be troubled. Why would he tell us not to let our hearts be troubled? Maybe because the world is full of what? Trouble. He said, let not your hearts be troubled because the world is going to serve you up three courses of trouble a day. <laughs> I don't know what your trouble is. You probably don't know all the details of what mine is, but we all got troubles. We all got something that's kind of shaking us up, don't we? We all have things that aren't just going perfect. I've met very few people whose life is just peaches and cream, rosy all the time. We got issues, we got things, we got troubles. What is Jesus saying? Don't let your hearts be troubled because this world around you is going to be full of trouble. I want to give you a peace that will dwell in here no matter what is going on out there. So if 9-11 happens again, and I'm not a prophet speaking something like that, but if something happens that rocks our world, whether that is our world or whether that is our world, we can have God's peace, Jesus' peace, because he gave it to us. So no matter what happens, let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. See, we can live as Talmudin of Jesus with no fear. No matter what's going on, we can live with no fear. But we gotta follow him as his disciple. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you. God, we thank you that you continue to lead us. God, that you found us. You found us in this place of being lost. God, we were all that little boy walking in the woods. And yet, you said, Jesus, you came to seek and save that which was lost. And I thank you that we were all there, God. And apart from you, we're still there. So Father, I thank you that you found us and at the same time we found you. God, I pray that you would give us the courage to face our fear and to follow you. God, that's a scary proposition to surrender and yet it's also the only path towards your true peace. So Father, I pray that we would have the faith, that we would trust you enough to face our fear, to follow you as your disciple. God, we thank you. We love you. Pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand with us. We're going to close and sing some praises to our very, very worthy Savior Jesus. Oh
That's a good song, amen? amen? That's what we're going to be doing for eternity, so we better like it. That's the song. That's, that's part of what we're going to be worshiping with. Um, praise the Lord. Hey, I want to encourage you, wherever you're at in that journey, just keep stepping. Keep stepping. If there's something God's asking you to do, sort of surrender, follow, um, just do it. Face that fear and do it. I don't know what that looks like. You know, certainly if you want to pray with someone about anything this morning, come on down. Um, these guys will be here to pray. I'll be here if you want to spend a little time in prayer. Um, again, Bayside 101, if you want to learn a little bit more about Bayside and what we do, sign right out in the hall. Just head right over there and uh, learn a little bit more about Bayside. I want to leave you again with these words of Jesus. Let this be what you go with this week. Jesus said, and he said this to you, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Amen? Go in God's peace today.